Hey, so everyone, welcome. This is our first uh, Bridge Forum of the academic year, and we're really excited. We're going to have uh, three presenters tonight. We're going to have uh, Cameron Briggs from Malta, Idaho, and Meg Wright from, I, I'm going to say, I, I should, I'll, I'll, I'll look at, I knew it was Washington, but yeah, Richland, Washington, and then I'll be our third speaker, and I'm from Springville, Utah. And I just wanted to read our mission statement, because I think it's kind of a key part of what we what we're about. And uh, the goal of the Bridge Forum is to use family history to create a kinder and more connected world. We provide a monthly forum to share projects that grow the family tree at familysearch.org and help people see their connections with each other and their communities. And um, I haven't been good about this in the past, but this year we're gonna really make it a very uh, non-denominational experience for everyone. And so if you're part of a particular faith tradition, just use words that are inclusive and uh, you know, I, I kind of uh, would be accessible for any, any group, um, but we're really excited. Um, there's a lot of really neat community projects going on right now using the family tree of family search. Um, but I, what I wanted to, like our real goal tonight is, um, and you're going to see these in the presentations, Cameron's created a website that I think if you are working with anyone that's trying to figure out how to use source linker on family search, which is where all the magic happens, uh, his website is, is amazing. I've, I've referred it to so many people. So I'm really grateful to have Cameron here. Uh, and then Meg has been doing some really amazing work with BYU Pathway. Um, so I'm really excited to have her talk about that because uh, we need. Uh, she needed to create a way that we could trust the work that they were doing. And in doing that, she's actually created some pretty amazing training materials and ways to test if people are making good decisions. And so I think that the work she's done with Pathway could be used for lots of youth groups and other community groups that want to get involved. And then I'm going to talk about uh, large scale community projects. Um, and the neat thing about a large scale community project is you can always break it up into smaller pieces. So you can turn a large scale community project into a very small scale community project too. But with that, we'll start with uh, Cameron. So Cameron, I'll just turn the mic over to you. All right, thank you. So uh, yeah, I, I'm involved in, in lots of different community projects so at any given time, but I found that the, the biggest struggle in helping get a community project off the ground um, was the training. And I can't be uh, over the shoulder of every single person that I train at all times when they go home and, and try to um, get linking sources on their computers. And so that's why I started creating some of these YouTube videos. And these YouTube videos started, um, I don't know, growing. I, I refer them to, to other people uh, and others that were working on their own community projects asked if I could share those. And so uh, it kind of just morphed into this website. Uh, as kind of a collect all for uh, source linking training videos. So source linker uh, for anyone that may not be familiar with it is um, a a feature of familysearch.org and uh, it looks uh, just a, a rough uh, <laughs> look at it right here, just a small little snippet where we're taking records that have been indexed and are linking them with existing families that are in the tree and determining if these are legitimate sources that need to be attached to them uh, to help prove their um, data points. And so, um, as you can imagine, there are many different types of records, uh, census records, birth records, death records, and they all come with their own nuances. Um, if anyone's linked sources before, uh, we know that uh, it's it's kind of tricky sometimes to, to take a, a look at a source and match it up with its family based upon years. Maybe the years are off a little bit. Maybe the, uh, the places are uh, uh, ambiguous a little bit. And so um, this website is to, to help kind of navigate all of those many questions that may come along the way. So I have the, the website uh, organized here up at the top, kind of by difficulty level. Um, that's the way that most people enter into it. So if you need help setting up your computer, uh, knowing how to install Google Chrome, for example, that's uh, often the, the browser of choice for many of the projects because of Google Sheets and how easy that is to, to share. Uh, for Goldie Mae, um, keyboard shortcuts, etc. Just some, some really basic uh, beginner videos there. And then um, beginning source linker here, it goes through from the very get go, what even is a source in source linker? If that's where we're at, uh, this is a great place to start and, and work our way kind of progressively through these videos. 
um, the, the left side versus the right side. Uh, what's the difference and, and how can you uh, learn and teach what the differences are uh, to help other people start linking sources. And so um, again, this website and, and these videos are meant to be very bite-sized. You'll notice that most of the videos are under five minutes long. They're very targeted to specific questions that you're going to encounter. Um, one of my biggest <laughs> struggles is trying to watch a two hour video to, for the one little nugget that I need um, to pull out of it. Uh, maybe I'm going to YouTube and, and searching because I'm, I'm encountering an error or um, I just don't know how to attach this one source. I, I, I just don't have time to <laughs> wade through a, an entire big video to, to look at it. And so um, that's the, the purpose of these videos is to be very concise. And so you'll notice underneath is the description of that video. And there are a couple that are like 20 minutes long, uh, just because you can get into some hairy situations. <laughs> if we need to, to detach, or maybe there's um, some, some family relationships that are a little bit hard to navigate, uh, sometimes uh, that may involve a little bit longer of a video. But most of these are, are very short and hopefully to the point and, and helpful uh, so that you can start gaining traction and, and learning how to attach sources. Then we go to the intermediate uh, series of videos, how to detach, how to change the focus person, add siblings, uh, maybe you've come across a, a mismatched gender. So the, the person on the left looks like it's a match for the person on the right, but on the left it's a male and on the left it's a female. Sometimes that happens as indexing uh, comes across. So how do you uh, tackle that? Um, there's many different uh, things. And you can see at the bottom of each of my pages is kind of my, my notepad of uh, videos that are requested or uh, things that I want to get to. <laughs> I, I'm kind of on a little bit of a break uh, working through uh, some of those ideas and how I want to revamp the site here in, in the near future. Um, advanced ones, um, maybe you're needing to, uh, to change for, for multiple spouses and uh, account for stepchildren or adopted children or um, other different uh, family scenarios there. Um, how to merge is, that's kind of a little bit outside of the scope of Source Linker, but I find that it's very common that we need to have um, concise ways to take a look at the, the very basics of how to merge if we do need to start um, tackling that. It almost needs its whole other website <laughs> for <laughs> merging nightmares. Um, I, I have only a, a couple uh, for the mobile. I'm planning on refilming everything um, so that there's a desktop library of videos and a mobile library of videos. Uh, but again, I'm kind of waiting on the new source linker. So um, project specific training. This one, uh, I'm just gathering a bunch of videos and kind of throwing them in here for lots of different kind of community projects. Uh, there's so many fun community projects out there. And so um, that's uh, one of my, my key focuses right now is, is trying to hunt down those videos and those training things and, and put them all here inside of Source Linker, uh, or sorry, in the project specific training tab. So on the home page, one other thing that I would point out is that down here at the bottom, if you do have a specific question that you are encountering in Source Linker, but don't even know quite the right question to ask, um, this may or may not be a helpful flowchart. Um, if you click on it, it'll open up in a new tab where you can zoom into it. You start up here at the top and it says, are you familiar with Source Linker and how it works? Yes or no. And so you work your way through this chart until you find uh, the question, uh, that you are encountering. I find that it's very helpful. I, I've tested it out on lots of different people uh, as we come up with uh, certain tricky spots in Source Linker that we might not know how to do. Um, each one of these blue boxes here on the peripheral of the chart is one of my videos. And so you kind of ask the, the simple yes or no questions to get to one of the videos. 
And once you do, then that blue box is going to be what the video is, is titled. And so you can either search for it um, here back on my website, up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a magnifying glass where you can actually type in that, uh, the name of the video or the name of the question, and it'll pop up with the page that it's on. Or you can uh, go over to my YouTube channel for Genie Greenie, and all of the videos will be on there that you could just search inside of that. But yeah, that's that's basically what I've got. So my videos are to help everyone else do their community projects. <laughs> and hopefully that's a, a helpful resource uh, for you to train and to help others train on uh, attaching sources and using the source linker inside of my search. Perfect. Thank you so much, Cameron. So we have a few minutes now to ask Cameron a few questions. So if you want to ask a question, you can just raise your hand or you can drop it in the chat, I guess. Cameron, here's, I'll just start off with a question and others can raise their hand. Do you have advice for people that want to create their own short videos? Like what, what have you found works really well for the way you've done it? Yeah, honestly, <laughs> it's kind of comes down to Zoom. Uh, Zoom is one of the easiest ways to just record a short video, especially if you're like sharing your screen. Um, that's one of the, the goals that I had with the website. I wanted to do it as uh, quick and fast as I, as I could. And so I just, I didn't want to go through lots of editing and, and post-production and all of that kind of stuff. And so uh, just recording on, on a Zoom, um, I, I often use the Record Linking Labs uh, spreadsheets to go and find specific scenarios <laughs> rather than hunting and pecking all over the tree and spending hours uh, finding a spreadsheet of one of the other community projects that are going on at any given minute and just kind of opening up those tabs and seeing if they match my specific scenario that I'm looking to film. And so I'll pull up those and then just kind of work through it really quick uh, in, in either just kind of uh, in my head or using the, the beta family search uh, site and, and actually playing around with it and then go to film really quick inside of Zoom. And then I've created this uh, sourcelinker101.com uh, just on one of the really cheap uh, Google sites, uh, mm -hmm. websites, so that it's just kind of plug and play. Mm -hmm. um, although I really want this like complex virtual assistant that <laughs> I want to put on that site. So I may be migrating that site eventually, but uh, I find that some of the community projects that um, either I'm involved in or I see others involved in, it's really easy to create like a, a quick Google site really quick for that specific uh -huh. um, that specific community project and only post the videos that are relevant to that project so that people don't have to go hunt and peck all over the place for it. Um, and that's one thing with all my videos. You're more than welcome to uh, to take them there. I, I could care less about copyright or anything like that. You can modify them. If you have a request, send it to me and I can film it. Um, but yeah, all of my stuff is, is freely given. Cool. Thank you, Cameron. Okay. We'll, we'll have additional questions at the end, but is there any quick question for Cameron right now? Okay. We're going to move on to Meg, but before we move on to Meg, I'm going to make a prediction here. I think five years from now, Cameron's going to be the face of family history. I think when people like think of like when they're going to do family history, like Cameron's going to be that face of that of that movement because because his videos are so good. So if you haven't seen his videos, and actually, Cameron, do you want to just post your the link to your website in the a chat or any other links that you think people might want? But with that, we'll we'll turn the mic over to Meg. So Meg, go ahead. You can share your screen, and we'll we'll let you go. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, just to introduce myself um, really quickly, I'm Meg Wright. I'm one of the students in Dr. Price's lab, and I've had the gift and privilege of working in the lab for the last almost year and a half. Um, so to start out, I wanted to explain the title. At the beginning, um, Dr. Price shared the mission statement of the Bridge Forum. And while I was preparing for this presentation, um, I saw that mission statement and this phrase from it really hit home for me, um, is create a kinder and more connected world. That's the purpose of family history and of the Bridge Forum. Um, and so 
the tools that I helped develop, I think also um, create a kinder and more connected world. And I'm super excited to tell you all about those tools and the process of creating them um, and everything that's led us to where we are right now. And before I can explain exactly what those tools are, I wanna tell you about the project that helped um, inspire the creation of them um, and exactly how they're being used right now. So um, the project is a um, collaboration between BYU Pathway Worldwide and the Record Linking Lab. So BYU Pathway Worldwide is an online um, secondary education program and people participated in it, in it from uh, 180 countries. But um, basically it's just online classes and um, it's college students that are working towards their degrees. So um, we wanted to harness those students um, and help them have meaningful experiences with family search and have and meaningful jobs as well, meaningful employment. So ideas for this project began in last October, uh, October 2022. And um, it quickly started. Um, the official rollout day was November 30th of 2022. And um, Part of the process of um, figuring out this project and exactly how it would work um, was deciding what we were going to do to standardize the approach to family history. So at the beginning of the project, there was 200 students involved, 200 students that were hired initially um, from eight different African countries and Papua New Guinea. And it's since expanded and there's more students participating in the program now um, in South America and other places. But um, I want to tell you about what the students do on the day-to-day -day level, because I think that um, explaining that will really help um, show exactly what the tools um, are can be used for um, and why we developed them the way that we did. So um, the students' initial project was attaching sources for the U.S. Census records. Um, they since moved on to attaching sources for the French records um, and doing reverse indexing. Um, all using tools developed by the Record Linking Lab. Um, so the button is the main tool that these students use, which is a tool that was developed by the Record Linking Lab. Um, and it just makes it super simple and easy for people to access a given set of records. So each button um, contains a set of records and, and those records are a project. Um, some of the ones are easy hints. So there's a just really good hints for beginners. Um, and the purpose of the button is to make it really easy to access these hints um, and to do work with them. Um, so Cameron already showed you an uh, image like this, but this is an example of what a source linking page looks like on Family Search. And when the project first started, me and a group of um, other students in the lab uh, were tasked with teaching these students how to source link on a really large scale. Um, we, it started out with 200 students, which is a big group of people, but we wanted it to be able to scale up to even more students really easily. So we needed to figure out how to standardize an approach to source linking. Um, and in the lab, each of us had experience with source linking, but in the lab, um, we were, I was at least taught how to do source linking on a person to person level. So somebody sat next to me and showed me how source linking worked and walked me through example after example um, and watched as I did it. And it was a really, really one on one approach. And we knew that that wasn't going to be possible for all of these 200 students. So it was the task was taking this information that we had learned on a person to person basis and translating that into training materials that would be good um, for people from all over the world um, and that they could feel comfortable and confident doing source linking from just those training materials. So we created the first set of training material videos and they worked really well. Um, and so we've rolled with that. Um, and since last uh, November, we've made a lot more of those. Um, but the thing that makes our training materials unique is that they're paired with quizzes. So each set of training materials covers a project. So the first initial project that we worked on um, was easy hints, just easy 1900 hints. Originally, they were all from the 1900 census. Since they've expanded and they include um, hints from all of the censuses, but 
Um, with this initial set of training materials, we created materials to teach people how to source link um, and then also how to source link those easy 1900 hints. So it was a specific approach um, and a general approach together. And since then, as we've added more specific projects, we've created more training materials that um, tie into those specific um, projects. But at the end of each set of um, training materials, we created quizzes. And the quizzes are about 10 questions each, and they show real examples from each of the projects um, and kind of just quiz and try to get a read of how well those training materials worked and how well um, whoever is watching those videos understands how to um, approach that specific project. And each of the projects is attached to a button and each um, project has a quiz and each project has a set of training materials. So it's really a cohesive package. Um, and I believe that these are the tools um, that can create a kinder and more connected world. Okay, so this is a on right here on my screen is an example of just what one of my training materials looks like. And like Cameron, they're just really short videos that focus on a specific skill, such as how to create a family search account. It starts really at the beginning, um, or how to create a new person. Um, and in those videos, they go through a lot of examples of both what to do and what not to do. Um, so the teaching is really done through specific examples rather than uh, just like a lecture type uh, video. And as I mentioned before, as the project evolved and more buttons or, or more projects were added to our uh, repertoire, um, new training materials were developed to go along with those projects. Um, and so this is a screenshot of just an example question from one of the quizzes. When we started the project, we wanted a way to measure how prepared students were to begin working on the family tree. And this is the way that we developed is creating these um, short quizzes. And um, they just go over the material from that set of training materials. And they provide instant feedback, which is really helpful as you're as you're learning these skills um, to learn what you're doing well and learn what you need to um, go back and review or improve on. Um, that's what these quizzes are meant to meant to be. They're meant to um, point out uh, what you can um, improve and if you're ready to um, work on hints from the map project or not. Um, although all of these training videos and quizzes were created with a single purpose in mind, which was um, preparing the BYU Pathway students to work on the tree, um, I think the way that these lessons and the tools that were developed by the students in the record linking lab are packaged, makes them really perfect for um, bigger audiences outside of the ones that they were originally intended for. Okay, so this is a picture of me in high school with my mom. And um, the reason I include this picture is because I think that I am a great example of how being involved in fam family history um, in small manageable ways can create a kinder, more connected world. Going back to the mission statement of Bridge Forum and how family search, uh, family history can help us create that kinder, more connected world. So as a teenager, I never did any family history. My dad was interested in it and he um, did it around me a lot, but I was never interested enough to ask him um, or to take part in that. Um, but I was exposed to it both through my dad and I participated in a, a weekly youth group through my church. And occasionally family history would um, be brought up and be an activity in the, that weekly group. Um, but because it was a bigger group and I could kind of fly over the, under the radar and talk to my friends in the corner, and I, I never really participated in it. I always felt kind of lost when it came to family history and I never really participated in it um, because I never knew where to start. It's a huge, family history encompasses so much. Um, and I never knew anything about it or even where to take my step into that into that world of um, doing family history and um, being more connected with other people and being more kind, because I think that family history really helps you with that. Um, but I know there are so many people out there that are were exactly like me that are willing and ready to help in these community causes, but don't really know where to start. Um, and I know that these training materials and quizzes and the button, the tool that was developed by the record linking lab, um, I think that's where they really come in is for people that were like me, 
that are like I was, I guess, <laughs> that um, don't know where to start or um, even what family history entails. Um, the work of family history can get really complicated, as um, I'm sure all of you know. But when it's broken down into palatable chunks, um, I know that it can be approachable, even for people who have no experience with it whatsoever. Um, and I know that uh, each of you are here because you're passionate about family history um, and using those tools to create a kinder and more connected world. Um, and I know that family history can help us achieve that. So thank you. Thanks, Meg. And Meg, do you have anything you want to post in the chat? Do you have a link? Oh, to any yes, I can. Um, yes, I'll post the link to a Google Doc with a list of all the training materials. Okay, perfect. Right. That, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'll just let everyone know the first time I took one of Meg's quizzes, I was so nervous I'd get questions wrong. So they're, I mean, the quizzes are really good. And actually for someone who has a lot of experience, they're, they're still a really good refresher to make sure that we're doing things well. And one thing I'll tell you about what Meg built. So Meg built something that allows anyone anywhere in the world to have meaningful work opportunities. And so because of the tool she's built, we're now exploring ways to give jobs to homeless people, people with disabilities, people in prison. Uh, basically, like it would be a way that if a donor said, hey, I really want to help this group, then rather than helping that group by giving them money, you could actually help that group by giving them meaningful work to do. And then Meg has it scaffolded into easy, medium, and hard. So basically everyone can help in, in some way. So Meg, thanks. You, uh, I don't know if everyone here knows what a big deal you are. So uh, uh, the fact that you like championed this pathway project is, is pretty amazing and created meaningful jobs for so many people. So that's pretty cool. Okay, I'll be our last presenter. So let me share my screen. Um, and, and so can you guys see my, do you guys see my slides okay? Let me go to presenter mode. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah, we can see them. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, doing a large scale community project. Um, but actually, I, I do want to say one thing about Meg's project is the button and the training materials actually allowed us to do a missing children project with some of the kids in our uh, neighborhood. And, um, and, and actually, that experience working with the kids trying to find missing children directly motivated one of the projects I'm going to show you today. So the two new projects that we've created is one is called Project 1912. And our goal is just to make sure that everyone born in 1912 in the 1920 census has a profile on the family tree. Um, and we're going to just start with families that have missing children on the tree. And what I mean by a missing child on the tree is you have a mom and a dad with maybe three of the kids, and then some of the kids got missed. And a lot of the 1912 kids got missed because if the family was added last year, then they would have run into the 110 year rule. And so some people just, just didn't add them because of the 110 year rule. So everyone else is there except for that 112, that 1912 uh, child. And then there's other families we can add to the tree. And then the other project is the census project for former slaves. Um, there's a recent new website called the 10 million person project where they're trying to identify people that were enslaved and, and gather together the records. And it made me realize that actually a lot of formerly enslaved people show up in U.S. Census records. So what I've been doing is gathering information on everyone, every Black person in U.S. Census records born before 1865. Um, and we're going to be able to connect them forward to their descendants through the 1940 census. And what this will allow people to do is if someone has a Black ancestor in the 1940 census, once they find that Black ancestor, we're going to be able to quickly guide them back to being able to see one of their enslaved uh, ancestors. So those are kind of the two projects I wanna show you today. But uh, but let me just describe one thing about the family tree because both these projects, you can go find these people in records. So they're already in records. So some people are like, well, if someone can find them in a record, isn't that enough? Like, why do we want them on the family tree? So I just wanted to list the things you can do once you're on the tree that you can't do if you're just in a record. So your information can be edited. So if there's anything that's incorrect about your information, we can fix it right there on the tree. We can also add things that weren't in the record. Uh, you can add photos and memories, which you can't do with a record. It's really easy to contact other contributors. Uh, the profiles have a better experience on the phone than a record. Uh, micro tasks can be created that involve beginners in family history. The um, profiles can actually be searched on the web without having to log in. 
And then uh, two things that I, I really like, though this relies on the tree also being connected, is you can see your relationship to other uh, contributors. And you can also see how you're related to famous people. So I'm really excited about in the future when someone finds their grandma on the 1940 census, that we could immediately give them a discovery experience and tell them other people that they're related to. Okay, so here's the 1912 project. And I'm gonna try to just move that down. Okay, so these are just some stats about the, uh, the 1920 census. So if you look here, we have 107 million people in the 1920 census and you know 24 million of them are listed as head of household there's 19 million spouses 23 million sons 22 million daughters some grandchildren some other relatives and non-relatives so what i do in this next column then is i just narrow in on just families that have someone who was born in 1912 so you can see it's about 13 million people this is kind of the breakdown by relationship and then the last column just focuses in on the people who were born in 1912 you can see there's 2.3 million of them most of them are sons or daughters. So there's some grandchildren, there's some other relatives, there's some non-relatives. You kind of wonder what a non-relative is. Actually, probably the most likely case in a non-relative is the son of a border, uh, of a rumor or border. But so these will be kind of interesting cases to look at. And so in this, in this situation, this is at the person level. And then down here below, what I did is I created some groups. So these are actually now at the... Uh, I think this might still be at the person level, but a lot of these people are part of families where everyone's on the tree. There's several where, um, where there's a hint we could use. There's a lot that have tree extending hints. And what I mean by a tree extending hint, it's a hint where some of the people in the family are already on the tree, and then there's others that are not. Um, and then there's cases where we don't have any way to connect the family to the tree. So these are just some basic stats about the project. Uh, and so these are some ways, if you want to help, uh, we have this URL right here that I'll put in the chat. This is our volunteer Google Doc. So after listening to Cameron's presentation, maybe in the future will be a Google website. Um, so it looks a little nicer. But if you go to this doc, you'll see that we have these tree growth projects. And number one right now is Project 1912. And then here's a little description about the project. And then if you hit state sheet, it'll take you into a Google sheet that just has all the states we're working on. And then if you click on one of those state sheets, you'll be in another Google sheet that'll have the hints. And then if you want to do it, you just put your name in, in the volunteer column. And then once you've finished the hint or decided that it's not a match, you just put a one in the results. And it's kind of fun to leapfrog each other where if you put your name in there, there'll be other people working at the same time. Darlene Briggs and I seem to have a very similar cadence. So that's always fun. And then when you click the URL, then you're in source linker and you can go from there. So really the Google sheet is just a way of keeping track of which families we have left to do. Now here's the um, census project for former uh, slaves. So we can identify everyone born before 1865. Um, uh, that That's uh, uh, er anyone who reports their race as black and born before 1865. We can also narrow in on certain birth states. So we do know that there was about 475 uh, free blacks in the United States. And so we're trying to think about ways to predict which, um, which these people might have been slaves and which might have been free. Um, and then the table here on the right gives you the count. So in the 1870 census, we have 4.1 million um, black individuals who were born before 1865. And then you can see in 1880, it's 3.6, 1902, 2 million. And even as late as 1940, there's 163,000 people that meet the criteria. Now to put this number, this 1870 number in context, in 1860, there were 3.9 million slaves and an additional 475,000 free blacks. So, so we actually think that the 1870 and 1880 census is actually a really great way to capture a lot of this population and make sure that they have a, a family, that they're on the family tree with their families. And so then all I did was I was just curious, um, and, and just to give some background on these large scale projects, I, I have the really, I'm really lucky in that family search has given me some census records and some ability to kind of check to see who's attached and who has hints. And so I was able to take those 12.5 million people, and for each year I could tell I could identify which ones are attached to the family tree, and that just means that this person in the 1870 census is attached as a source to someone on the family tree. There's another 120,000 that have a five-star match on the tree, and then 3.7 million that don't have a match. That doesn't mean they're not on the tree. It just means we don't know using our automated tools. We don't know who who they are. Uh, and so I can do that across all of the different census years. Since we have about 421,000 hints, we have about 3.8 million person year observations that are attached. And then what I can do, this is at the individual level. I can break this down to the family level. 
And so we have about 174,000 uh, hints that we could do. Because each time you do one of these hints, you might be attaching multiple people from over here. Um, and so this link right here, which I'll also put in the chat, uh, allows you to access these, uh, these hints. Okay. Um, and the neat thing is, and I'll do a live demo of this, is you can actually customize either one of these projects. You don't need any of my Google Sheets to get involved with this. You can just search on Family Search for someone that meets the criteria. And then the neat thing is you can uh, make the criteria very specific to you. So in my case, I wanted to do the prices that were born in 1912. And so I can just work my way systematically through all the prices that were part of the project 1912. Or I could do all the prices that were um, born before 1865. And then you can see right here under race, I could filter these down to just African-Americans. And that would allow me to do the um, former enslaved project, but just for the people that have my own uh, surname. Okay, so let me, let me now uh, exit out of this. And what I'm gonna do is just open up a browser and just do a, a live, uh, uh, live demo. So here I am in uh, Family Search, and um, I'm just going to, and I'll try not to do this too fast. I, I kind of, I do tend to get excited and just do it really fast. So I'll, I'll go, I, I, Cameron has much better pacing than I do. So, so I'm just going to go search records. And so for the Project 1912, we're using the 1920 census. So I would just type in here, United States Census. Oops. Okay. And then I would type in price. And then I'd hit more options. And then here under birth, I put 1912. Oops, there we go. And then I'm gonna make it exact on my last name. And then I would hit uh, search. And um, so there's 79,000. So I've got a lot of work cut out for me. So if I wanted, I could also maybe narrow it down to maybe those that were born in Virginia. I might just make, you know, I always like it if I can find kind of smaller uh, bite sizes, even that's a big, a big group. That's okay. The, the key thing is a lot of these are already done. So you can see right here, this, that icon right there means it's already attached. And this one's not attached, but it is a really interesting person like WI asterisk with no other family members. So this is when I'd probably want to go into the image and try to figure out what's going on. But let's kind of scroll down here. So that icon right there, that's a hint. So if I right click on that and hit open link in new window, then I could actually do the hint for that family. And so notice this is a case where the other family members are already attached. And so I can come in here and attach that as well. And some of the nice clues was you can see she was born in Montgomery County and here she is living in Montgomery County. And so, and if I come back here, then that thing in the future will turn into one that um, is, is attached. Uh, one thing, if you ever see these like little kids living by themselves with no family members, it usually just means this, the family search cut the census record with a new sheet and kind of left the kid as like a little floater. So I often will go look for that person on Ancestry. Ancestry does a better job at kind of putting the families back together. But let's just find one, just as a last example, let's just find, so here's a nice one. Here you see Lucille, she's got her mom and dad, a bunch of siblings. So we're going to go take a look at her record. Now, if she had a record hint, you would also see something showing up right here. You'll also sometimes see similar records. So I find that these are actually a really good way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this ID. So it says ID copied. And I, all I did was I just clicked on it. And then I'm going to hit attach to family tree. And then right here, I'm just going to drop in this ID that family search gave me. And notice that it puts me right into this place where I've got all these family members lining up really well. And so notice here, the parents were already attached. This person was attached. And then uh, for whatever reason, someone did not attach these other ones. And so, but the neat thing now is now I know where Lucille was born. She was born in Virginia. So we can add, add that over. So I'm just gonna use Goldie Mae and do the uh, attaching. But uh, what I'll find sometimes is when I'm here in Source Linker, I'll maybe see that the parents have a hint and then I can attach Lucille as a, as a new person. Um, and then I can always add Lucille as an unconnected person on the family tree and then try to branch out uh, from there. Okay. Um, so let me stop, stop share. So I think the main thing I wanted to just um, show with those projects, and I'm sorry if I went too fast. I, I, that's, a, that's a flaw I have, but I think the key thing is that I just, I, I kind of fell in love with the idea of adding missing children to the tree. When I did that youth activity, it was so neat for kids to find missing children. And it was just what I wanted to do. And so I was really grateful to figure out a way to do the 1912 project as a way to add the missing children. 
And then for some of my research, we've been thinking a lot about formerly enslaved people and, and the outcomes of their children and how to create discovery experiences. And I was just really grateful to be able to set, set that up. And so uh, both of those will be things you can access on the Record Linking Lab uh, volunteer page. With that, we're gonna open up for questions. Uh, and I forgot to give time for you guys to ask Meg questions. So actually at this point, you're welcome to just raise your hand and you can ask any one of the three speakers uh, your, your questions or feel free to share comments as well. But yeah. Yeah, Will you clarify how to find your Facebook page to find your recordings? I struggled with that last year. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can show that. That's a great, uh, that's, this is a good procedural question. Let me just show that really fast. So if you go to Facebook, um, and then when you're in Facebook, you're just going to search for record linking lab. And then you can just kind of, once you're in record linking lab, you can right here, then once you're in there, there's you can just kind of see all the different posts by just scrolling down. And so right here is the post for the Bridge Forum. And so right down here in the comments, I'll be putting a link to this. And so if you scroll down even farther to the Bridge Forums, and it'll always usually have a picture that looks like this. If you scroll down, uh, you'll be able to access past recordings as well. But the, the Facebook page is a really good way to, to know when we'll be um, sharing. Does it, did that help Pat? Pat? Is that yes. It? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yep. no problem. Thank you. Okay. Other questions. And if for questions, you can just raise your hand or you can drop something in the comments or the chat, or even if your video is on, you can just raise your hand using like old school hand raising. I guess I have a question for you, Joe. Yeah. Bruce. yeah. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so, um, how far along are you then on 1870, 1880, um, in the tree, um, or tree building efforts? Uh, we, yeah, we can talk about that offline. So, yeah, so we, we did, we did some stuff and we were, uh, yeah, so there, there was some tree growth that happened. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Excited uh, what, what you're doing. Um, if Chris is a great overview. Yeah. Yeah. The, if just so everyone, I mean, everyone probably knows the 1870 has this one fatal flaw, which is it doesn't have relationships in it. You can usually tell the relationships if you just think carefully about the way a family would normally be structured, but it, it doesn't in there specifically. So you have to be just a little bit more careful about how you put families back together in 1870. But 1880 is really great because you do get the family relationships for the first time. And so we have done some uh, tree adding for families in the 1880 census. And actually, well, so definitely think of a question. I'm going to do one last demo for it because I forgot to show you if you wanted to help with a formerly enslaved person, let me show you how to do that. But again, think of some questions because I'd love uh, for us to have some questions for Meg and, and Cameron and me, but let me just show you that really quick so you can kind of see the steps. So if I were to come into family search, this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to search records. Okay, and let's this time let's do, we, we could again do United States census. I, I really like the 1900 census. So that's probably where I might start. And then what I could do is I could come over here and say, okay, I want someone who was born somewhere between 1800 and 1865. And I want them to have my last name. And let's actually, um, let me see that. Okay, so notice my search criteria is a, a birth range, a surname, and then a race. And so if we do that, and this will allow me to find um, some formerly enslaved people that have my surname. I could also do it for my community. So Pat's from Washington, we could type in, you know, formerly enslaved people that were living in Washington in 1900. Or I know we have uh, some people here from South Carolina, you could do it for South Carolina. Now notice as I look down, you can see that person's attached, that person's attached, that person's attached, that person's attached. So there's a lot of the prices that are attached, um, which is really, really neat. Uh, I mean, I've been working on them. And so, but then, uh, what I can do is you can always open up a, a hundred so you can kind of see more, but let's just, let's just do one together here really quick. And so let's just scroll down. And so what I'm looking for is one that has a family that's not attached. And maybe we're going to have to jump to a future to other pages. You see, I've been kind of excited about this project. So let me just jump to kind of a future that's kind of farther down the list. And let's see. So right here, so you can see Clara Price. 
Here she is living. Oh no, she's on there. It just took a second for it to show up. Maybe I'll, I'll have to pick another. Let's do brand. We'll, we'll Bruce. We'll since since you're you're here, we'll just do. We'll see if we have some uh, formerly enslaved people with your surname. So it's a smaller group. Um, you can see uh, some of them are attached, but right here, Gilbert Brand uh, was born 1835. Here he is with his spouse Faith and with his children, and it's showing us here that he doesn't seem to be have a match on the family tree. So then I come here to the record page. And notice we don't have any similar records for him. So what I'm going to do, this is going to just take two windows really fast. So I'm going to open up a second window right here. So notice on the left, we have our record window. And then on our right, we are now on a person page. And this is like the hidden button that's really good to know about. It's called the add unconnected person button. You hit the add unconnected person. And I'm going to bring Gilbert Brand's number data right over here. And then I'm going to add Gilbert Brand as a new person to the family tree. And so notice now he is a new, he's a brand new person on the tree. And then um, notice I, all I did was I put his name in because when I come back over to this side, um, then I can hit that. Now this is interesting because actually look at that. His wife was already on the tree and one of his kids was on the tree. So then that makes it really easy now to then connect our Gilbert to his wife. And so now, and I know these are extra steps. So this is where you got to watch Cameron's videos uh, to kind of like uh, see some of the things we're doing right now, but I just gave him his wife. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is come back to source linker and refresh and notice now there he is with his wife. So now we've got Gilbert and his wife, and, and then we can actually now add their other kids. And so because of this, now James is now on the tree and then Hampton's going to be on the tree. And then, um, uh, Gilbert, uh, Gilbert Jr. is going to be on the tree. And then I'm going to be able to reconnect Victoria to the tree. But this is what I love about SourceLinker is just like us, just like the group of us right here, just meeting via Zoom and just doing a little bit of work online. We just added four brand new people to the tree. One of them is formerly enslaved. We have three other kids. And then we can take Victoria and we can just reconnect her with her father. She was just kind of uh, there with her mother on the tree. And now we have this, because of the census record, we have this really nice connected family. And so we can come in here and we can do that. And so um, if you're like, wow, that, that's way too many steps. I mean, the neat thing is if you just sit next to someone who loves family history, like a lot of those steps were just pretty normal. I think the only non-traditional step was probably the adding an unconnected person. Okay. But, uh, and then I guess you'll have the video so you can go back and look at that, but you could, so Bruce, here's my challenge to you. Maybe you could go and do the other, you know, 300 brands that kind of fall into this category. And so, and if you need help, we can, we can help you out with that. Let's, uh, I don't know, are there some other, other questions? So feel free, raise your hand, uh, or, um, just using the zoom chat. Make, can I, I'll ask you a question while we're waiting for people. Um, how did you create your videos and do you have any advice for the way you do videos where you're, um, yeah, because your videos are really awesome too. I, I mean, it's really neat that both you and Cameron have created a lot of content. I'm just curious if you have any advice for people that want to do the same. Yeah, I just found like a, a screen recording um, Chrome extension and have been using that. But um, I love Cameron's, I haven't uploaded them to YouTube. So I love Cameron's approach to that. I need to do that. Okay. So quick question for, for Meg on that. Um, how do you um, go about structuring your quizzes and, and figuring out um, what are the best questions to ask to determine if people are ready to, to begin a project or you know, just kind of like that whole process of, of creating the quiz? How do you go about that? Yeah, when we first started out, we like the first one is pretty simple. It's it, most of the questions are, is this a match or not? And we just went through and found some that were matches and found some that weren't matches. Um, as projects start to go, started to get more complicated, um, our quizzes started to get more complicated with um, the questions. Um, and one really cool thing that I'm kind of proud of about the quizzes is um, in most of the quizzes, when you um, answer a question, if you answer it wrong, then it takes you to a re review right away. Um, and then when you complete that review, it takes you back to where you were in the quiz and, and you continue on. Um, so there's like review built into the quizzes. Um, and then after the quizzes were made, um, we had access to all the stats about which questions were commonly missed. And so we went back through and made review videos for all of those questions. And those are also available on that training sheet too. Mm -hmm. 
And and you're doing all of it inside of like Google Forms, I'm assuming. Yeah, all the okay. quizzes are Google Forms. Yeah. Sweet. And Meg, do you think people could use your quizzes like as like a competition with youth or something? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes. You get an email right away when you complete one, so it, that kind of helps. The the you could do a competition like live at live with all of the youth. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope in the future source thinking is like a high school sport. <laughs> like, uh, like, you know, like, I am the best source thinker in Springville. Like, I'm gonna, that, that'd be pretty awesome. I mean, that is something I should I should advocate is we really do need to get the younger people involved in source linking because they're so good at it. Like, it's it's basically like a pretty low in video game in terms of information processing. And people hate it when I make that analogy, but I, I mean, in terms of how much information they process with some of their complicated video games, like Family Histories on, on on the more simple side of uh, things. Um, that'll be neat as family history starts to use more colors to try to um, help with uh, matching and stuff. Okay, so we just have a couple minutes. Any any other questions for one of our presenters? Hey, with that, we'll, we'll kind of end the formal meeting. You're welcome to stick around and uh, uh, and you'll, you'll have access to recording if you wanna share it with other people. Um, but definitely here would be my three takeaways for you. Uh, Cameron's website is just amazing. So if you haven't watched his videos, I love the way he's broken it up into little pieces. I, I love the way he described it is that if I need to solve a problem, I don't want to watch an hour long video. I want to go exactly to the two minute video that shows me how to fix my lawnmower. And basically Cameron has done that for all the pieces and all the parts of, of family history. The thing I hope you take away with from Meg's is um, there are some really amazing ways that we can train people to do family history. And I think the quizzes is a really underlooked aspect of this. There's just something really powerful about taking a quiz that helps you learn. I, I think we always think of like quizzes as this horrible thing we have to do, but actually quizzes can be the most powerful way to learn something because you can think you know something, but the quiz helps you uh, actually focus in on things that you might want to learn. And then I think with uh, with my, my presentation, what I hope you take away is that um, I really think that the people born in 1912 are the perfect group for us to focus on these last few months because they they are about the most they're the most brand new people you can have that still meet the 110 year rule. So uh, and then the neat thing is right as soon as we get to January we're going to probably start Project 1913 because that'll be a whole fresh new batch of people that um, meet the 110 year rule uh, for adding people to the tree and other things like that. Hey, well, thanks everyone for coming and definitely feel free to reach out with me for uh, 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 future presenters. And Chris did make a really good point. I also post a recording on the Facebook group called Let's Do Good Together. It's a really good group to be, be part of and um, I think you'd enjoy that. But um, thanks. So I'm gonna stop the recording and uh, we can still have a, a conversation once I do that.